Okay, okay so um, we're still in chapter two. Uh, there is some ma new material today. I, I briefly want to talk about a tap delay line. It's one way to implement, it's a simple way to implement a, a circuit with a particular impulse response, right? I mean, that's, that's the key thing for us is, you know, how do we design these circuits that, you know, we, we have a desired frequency response, you know, we take an inverse Fourier transform to get an impulse response, but how do we design a circuit that has that frequency response or that impulse response, they're equivalent. Well, there are analog circuit design techniques and, and we do occasionally offer this analog design course that teaches you how to design circuits with a particular frequency response. But we'll look right now on how to design a circuit. It's probably the simplest technique, uh, design a circuit that has a given impulse response, okay. And then uh, also wanna start taking a look at, at filters and the effect of filters on signals. Um, um, uh, we'll, initially look at an ideal low pass filter. Next week, we'll actually start into the material in the course and we'll look at amplitude modulation. And you should have a pretty good idea of how amplitude modulation works, how AM radio works. Traditional television actually used a form of amplitude modulation as well. Uh, we do have a lot of equipment in the, in the communications lab. I've got to get in there and make sure that so we've got a lot of computers in there that run software defined radios, which is a, a programmable radio that you can program it to receive all kinds of different modulation techniques. Um, but I'm not sure, um, it hasn't been used in a while and I didn't get a chance to test it over the summer. So we've got some software in there. We've got some different transmitters for AM, FM. So at least that you can get in the lab and, and see the spectra. So when we get into that, I'll. I'll give you your first project working with uh, some of the software defined uh, radio equipment that we have in the lab. So th this is actually a continuation of our discussion on linear systems. So a tapped delay line TDL. So um, we know that for a given filter with a certain impulse response, we can calculate the output filter, the output of the filter by carrying out the convolution. Okay. Uh, so we're going to take the case where H of T is causal and of duration TF, you know, so it might be something like that or, you know, more generally, you know, it might be like a decaying exponential response, which is really infinite but when it gets small enough, we'll truncate it at that point and, and use that as an approximation to, to the actual impulse response. And duration uh, TF, in which case, um, Y of T is zero to TF because that's the duration of H of T, X of T minus tau. And then the other simplification we're gonna make is we're gonna do this digitally. It's actually um, uh, easier to filter a sampled version of, of the signal. So th this would be appropriate for audio signals, low frequency signals. And it's, it can be difficult to, to sample at a rate high enough that we meet the Nyquist criteria for high frequency signals, radio signals. But this is an appropriate filtering technique for lower frequency signals, signals in the audio range. So sample at delta tau, so T is equal to N delta tau, and then 
tau, which is also a continuous variable, it's going to be sampled at the same rate. Okay, so our we can replace our approximate our integral by a sum k equals zero to n minus one h of k delta tau. So this represents our sampled impulse response. And then this is our sampled input and then delta tau to replace the dt. So that's just approximating the integral using rectangular integration essentially. Where capital N is the duration of H of T divided by delta tau. Okay. So essentially we call this TF. This is delta tau, our sample inter interval. And then N is the number of samples, okay, from zero out to out to TF. Then we define what we know, what we call the the filter weights W of k, our H of k, delta tau, d tau. This is just scaling. Delta tau is just scaling the amplitude of the impulse response to account for the integration. Okay, that's the rectangular integration part. Then y of n delta t is the sum from k equals zero to n minus one of w of k x of n delta tau minus k delta tau. Okay. So we can actually implement that summation in you know block diagram form implementation. So we have our sampled input coming in. Okay. And then we have a series of delta tau delays. So in a, in a digital system with digital inputs, these could just be clocked registers. Each register holds a sample, or it could be we could actually implement this in computer software or actually storing these into an array, each sample into an array. And then, so I've got a line here of where I hold previous values. So this value would actually be X of N delta T, delta tau minus delta tau the previous sample, this would be X of N delta tau minus two delta tau. So I need all of these for K going from zero to N minus one. And so this last one actually is X of N delta tau minus N minus one delta tau. Okay. So that these delays are storing these in, in the memory is, is giving me all those delayed versions of, you know, essentially what I'm trying to do is this is W zero times X of N delta tau. That's with K equal to zero plus W one W N delta tau minus delta tau. So that would be the previous sample, right? plus W2, so finally the upper limit here is I've got N capital N samples going from zero to N minus one. So the last one would be W N minus one X of N delta tau minus N minus one delta tau. So I'm trying to implement that summation in, in hardware. Uh, this is, this is what's called the, the tapped delays, okay? Or actually it's just the delay line. I haven't tapped off the values yet. And then what I need to do is 
multiply this one by W0, multiply this one by W1. Notice these are constants, right? H is my desired impulse response my desired impulse response. I'm trying to design a filter that has an H of tau impulse response. Okay, so this is kind of an, a way to do that by sampling the signal and doing this in the digital domain. So, but all of my W's, my filter weights are directly re, uh, related to the impulse response I want. So the procedure here, you've, you've got a given H of F, frequency response. We could take the inverse Fourier transform to get the impulse response, sample that to get these W of Ks. Okay. Uh, this last one, we multiply by W of N minus one. Right? And then what do I need to do? I need to add all these things together. I have them all come into a summing block that I represent as, as sigma. And then, so for every input sample, you know, I have, my computer has to do a lot of work or I could do this in digital hardware, design a, a, a digital hardware system that does this. You know, for every new sample, I've got to multiply my weights times, you know, all the previous samples, sum them all up, to calculate my new output, a uh, new output. The next input of X, the next sample of X comes in, I have to redo all of this, this calculations. So there are, I'm uh, doing um, N multiplications and summing N values every sample to produce my new output. Okay. So again, this would be a, a, a discrete time approximation to the, the continuous, that continuous time filter. But again, that's kind of the way we're heading with everything is doing, you know, at least, at least all low audio frequency processing, low frequency processing in the, in the digital time, discrete time domain using microcontrollers, computers, instead of traditional um, analog circuits to, you know, RLC circuits. So this is called a tapped delay line. So th the top structure there is the delay line, and then I'm pulling off the values or tapping off the values into each of those delays to get this, this structure. So if we wanted to do this, you know, with a continuous time signal, we would have an A to D converter, a tap delay line, and then a D to A converter, to get back our continuous time signal. Seems like a lot of work, right? But again, software is cheap, computer hardware is cheap. So this is an approach that's being used more and more commonly. As opposed to, you know, the, uh, if we stayed in, in the analog domain, we would have an RLC circuit here, and we'd have to do that, design that RLC circuit that had the same impulse response. Okay. But this, this is one approach using um, discrete time processing. Okay. And we present it here because it's fairly straightforward. It's actually design, um, to design an analog circuit that has a particular frequency response is, quite a bit of work actually. Okay, and again, a whole, whole course. Whereas here I can show you this technique in, uh, in a quarter of a lecture. Okay. Um, okay, so let's talk about filtering. We will be using filters throughout the course in particular, probably low pass filters more, more than any other type of filter. Um, usually the first thing you do after demodulating at the receiver is you run the demodulated output through a low pass filter that eliminates some high frequency components that, that appear if it, 
um, that are present in the demodulated signal. So, um, what we first want to talk about is what does a distortionless So I'll say channel or filter what does the term distortionless mean and I say channel here because this may represent uh, you know signal that's be tra being transmitted wireless wirelessly or it may actually be you know some filter in our receiver but um, and for a transmission channel we can model that actually as a, as a circuit okay but what does it mean if we have one signal that's a distortionless version of another signal? Okay. So it really means that they should look the same somehow. Okay. Well, certainly we'll allow just multiplication by a scalar constant, you know, either amplification or attenuation. If A is less than one, that's attenuation. If A is greater than one, we get an amplified version of the signal. Okay. That that would we would call that a distortionless signal. Okay. It looks identical except for scaled and amplitude. Okay. The other thing that we allow for a distortionless signal, it's my notation. So we allow time delay. Okay. So you know, I think you guys are all aware that, you know, when you listen to sports or watch TV, you're actually on the radio or television, you're seeing a delayed version of the actual event. Okay. Um, hopefully that's a true replica or this undistorted version of what's actually, you know, whatever the, the baseball broadcaster is, is, is saying under the microphone. Of course, you can control the volume of your radio you don't really have much control over the time delay, but we allow a time delay in this distortionless in this distortionless filter or channel. Yeah. Um, what does this look like in the frequency domain? In the frequency domain, if we take the Fourier transform of both sides, the delay just becomes an e to the minus j two pi f t zero times x of f. Okay. So I'll put since h of f is y of f over x of f. This is equal to E, a e to the minus j two pi f t zero. So this would be the frequency response of a distortionless filter. Now, most filters aren't distortionless, right? They're, you know, when we're, we're filtering out something, we're trying to re remove components, you know, with a low pass filter, we're trying to remove high frequency components or perhaps noise. We're, we're not trying to actually pervert, preserve the noise, or we're trying to remove some sort of interference, okay? So generally, if we're actually filtering something out, we don't want it, you know, it's not distortionless. We, we, we're wanting to improve the input, which has, you know, some interference or some uh, noise added that we're trying to actually improve, improve that input. But what we're talking about right now is what are the characteristics of a distortionless channel or a distortionless filter? Okay. Um, often we might have a channel that introduces distortion somehow. It's possible to perhaps at your receiver have a, an, inverse, uh, an inverse filter that undoes that distortion. That would be the reason for you know, talking about what, what's a distortionless filter look like, okay, or what are the characteristics of a distortionless filter. So 
the amplitude response is A for all frequencies. Okay. You know, the, the magnet, this, this again is a point on the unit circle. Um, the phase response is just minus two pi F T zero. So if I were to graph these, the, the amplitude response of a distortionless filter is constant, okay? It should amplify or attenuate all frequencies the same. Okay. That kind of makes sense, right? That we want it to be an exact replica of the input, so it's got to it's got to scale all the all the frequency components the same. Again, a low-pass filter is going to actually multiply the high-frequency com components by zero to get rid of those. Okay, but a distortionless filter should have this characteristic. <laughs> the phase response, if I plot that as a function of frequency, um, at zero, this is zero. And then it has a slope of actually negative two, two pi t zero. So m is minus two pi t zero. So the bigger the t zero, the, the steeper that line is. Okay. But a dis the phase response of a distortionless filter should be linear, a linear function of frequency. Now, and the greater the slope here, the larger the delay. If the slope is zero, this is the thing always should go through the origin, but if the slope is zero, there's no, de no delay. So, and I think you guys probably talked about that in your uh, uh, DSP class, you know, when talking about FIR filters. Uh, FIR filters, you can design them so they have linear phase that corresponds to constant delay. Okay, now uh, a constant time delay, to actually get a constant time delay, we need to have a different phase shift at, at each frequency. That's what this is saying. We need to have a linear phase shift that's a function of frequency. Um, of course, the, the impulse response of this, the inverse transform of this is just A, the inverse transform of that is just delta T minus T zero. Okay. So again, you could look at this in the time domain we know when we convolve x of t with a delta, we get just a delayed version of the delta, right? We get a x of t minus t zero. So this is what the corresponding impulse response of, of a distortionless channel would look like or distortionless filter. Okay. Well, we, we can relax the requirements a little bit. The reason is that typically the signals we're working with don't contain all frequencies. You know, you know, a low frequency signal is, you know, has zero content, maybe above 15 kilohertz or something like that. So we can relax the requirements. slightly with H of F is A rect F of 2B over E to the minus J 2 pi F T zero. Then Y of F is um, A X of F E to the minus J two pi F T zero and Y of T is still A X of T minus T zero as long as I've got this rect function in here, as long as that rect is wider than the bandwidth of my, my signal. So now I'm saying I can relax this a little bit. This doesn't have to be constant at all frequencies. It would be impossible to build a, 
um, a circuit that had that response. I can relax it a little bit um, and make this erect. As long as you know X of F had a response like that, right? Then the product of those is going to be the same. As long as B is greater than the signal bandwidth. Okay. Then I have B minus B A. The phase response would still be linear. Now, this is what we call an ideal low pass filter. Okay. Now, again, typically you would use this to filter out unwanted high frequency components so that you're actually trying to recover the undistorted signal. You know, you have the signal that gets transmitted across a channel. Maybe there are high frequency inter interfering components that are introduced that you see at the receiver and you want to filter those out. So what this ideal low pass filter should I should do, you know, if your if your signal content is all um, uh, within this minus B to B band is recover that and then eliminate any of these unwanted components. Okay. You know, sometimes, you know, you guys uh, probably have never heard cassette tape, but you know, cassette tape had, could have high frequency hiss, especially at high volumes. So, you know, you can, you can eliminate that hiss, which is noise by actually running it through a, a low pass filter. Um, What's the, what's the impulse response of an ideal low pass filter? What's the Fourier transform of erect? Remember that becomes a sink. So erect in time becomes a sink. Erect in frequency becomes a sink in time. Okay, remember the Fourier transform and inverse Fourier transform are, are really similar integrals. They just differ in that minus sign. So the corresponding impulse response is h of t is 2 a b sync of 2 b t minus t zero. So what that would look like, what the impulse response here would look like, it's a delayed sync. And it would have a height of 2AB. One, one of the problems with this, or do you notice a problem with this particular impulse response? Let me ask, is it causal? What's the condition for causality? Yeah, it has to be zero for all t less than zero. So this is the response, remember, to an impulse arriving at t equal to zero. Okay, my ideal low pass filter, I, if, I have, if I feed it an impulse at t equal to zero, I get this sink output. The main lobe of the sink occurs t zero seconds later, but notice there is a portion of the output, you know, these should all be the same width. Um, and this is twice as wide as these, but, um, this this ideal filter needs to start producing an output before the impulse arrives. You can't build a system that does that. That's called a non-causal system. Okay, but you know, hopefully, with the day, delay large enough, you know, we may be able to truncate this to approximate the ideal response. But you, but you can't you can't. This is why it's called ideal. 
you can't d build an ideal low pass filter because it's non causal. Okay. We can approximate it. You know, and one way to do that, and there are other ways, other ways involving windowing, which are t techniques that you may remember from your DSP class. But one way is just truncate the, if we delay it enough, if we have enough of, of a delay, then we can, we can truncate you know, the response. Uh, for negative T and then implement this filter instead that has this impulse response. It's n it wouldn't be an ideal low pass filter, but hopefully it would be enough like this ideal low pass filter that we're trying to design. So let's see what <clears throat> this low pass filter does when we pass it a pulse. We know what it produces when we pass it an impulse, but again, an impulse isn't a, um, a common signal. Um, but certainly in digital data communications, our data, you know, we sample the analog input, we, we convert it into a series of, of binary pulses, binary words, and then transmit those as pulses. So the pulse response of any sort of system is going to be of importance to us. So, consider h of t is equal to 2b sync of 2b of t. So I'm going to first talk about, we'll first talk about the, the response of, this is um, uh, an ideal low pass filter with no delay. Okay. But if I introduce a delay, that would just introduce, that would just delay the output by the same amount because of time invariance, okay. But it's a little easier to do the math with this function and so I'm not carrying around the T0 all the time, okay. In the, in the frequency domain, T0 is zero. Remember that's the slope of this phase line that would correspond to a perfectly horizontal phase line. Still linear, but it's it's uh, it's zero in that case. So two this input x of t is rect of t over t, and in particular, you know what what the output's going to look like. It's going to depend on the width of my pulse, and also what I could call the bandwidth of, you know, my bandwidth of my filter, capital B here, you know. So um, it's gonna depend on those two parameters. So this is what I'm going to, to feed this ideal filter. And I'm, in particular, I'm, I'm concerned with what, what's the relationship between B and T so that my output pulse looks kind of like my input pulse. I, I want to try to preserve the, the pulse shapes. We're never entirely successful in doing that. But, you know, if, if I've got a digital waveform like this, you know, maybe after transmission, you know, there's noise added, you know, what I get is maybe something like that at my receiver. Hopefully I can still recover, you know, the, the ones and zeros by sampling this, comparing it to a threshold. You know, um, you know, I will always receive a distorted version of the transmitted pulse train. But what are the conditions here for our ideal low pass filter to try and minimize the amount of distortion? Um, so, I can write this as x of t is u of t plus t over two minus u of t minus t over two. So I can use superposition or linearity. You know, if I can find the step response of my ideal low pass filter, I can come up with the, the pulse response. Okay. Now, when I convolve with a unit step, remember that that corresponds to integrating 
in this case, integrating this thing. You know, a sink is nasty enough. Now I've got to deal with an integrated sink. Okay. Um, the response is y of t one over one over pi, and then it's it's this, it's called the sine integral. It's actually the integral of a sink, but it's called the sine integral of two pi b t plus t over two. That's the response to that unit step minus one over pi. Again, the sine integral two pi b t minus t over two. where SI of U is the integral from zero to U of sine X over X DX. Okay. So again, it's something you, you probably haven't run across in the past. It's a sine integral. I mean, I'm not gonna do a lot with this. You'd have to play around and see what it looks like. And, and you know, by plotting it actually, uh, um, We've done that, or he's done that in the in the book. Uh, and so this this is the general shape of my output of my low pass my ideal low pass filter to this pulse. Okay. Again, we see um, here that it's not this nice square pulse. There's this ringing that occurs, okay? This uh, sinusoidal oscillation that's added on onto my pulse. Um, the general width of the, it, you know, it's, it's spread a little bit, you know, ideally it would just go from minus T over two to, to T over two. So it's spread out a little bit as well as it's got this, this ringing that's equal to, to the, the time duration of the ringing there is actually uh, uh, one over the, one over B, which indicates that as, as I make my bandwidth broader, the, 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 the period of the ringing is going to get smaller and smaller. So um, here's some other figures. Let's see, uh, pulse response, uh, when, the, when the duration is one second and the time bandwidth product is, in this case, it's five. Um, and then that's what the pulse output would look like. When the band time with product is 10 or larger, I get that. When it's, what is it here? It's 100, no, it's 20. And finally, 100. So it's still getting, as this BT product improves, so either my bandwidth gets larger or my signal gets wider the response gets better and better looking. Okay, either one of those, it's, it depends what, what the pulse output looks like depends on the product of B and the pulse duration. So if I make my pulse wider, or if I include, increase the bandwidth of my filter, I get better and better looking results, you know, the results that look more like what the input pulse is. Now there's always, there's always this, thing here, okay, this is called Gibbs phenomenon. It's about 9% overshoot, okay? So that's always going to be present, even as I can continue to increase BT. It actually doesn't even get smaller. It stays at about the same height um, as BT increases. So I'm always gonna deal with that. But here, you know, I've essentially gotten rid of, you know, the ringing here, at least in the middle is so small, it's not, not really observable. Um, and are, are the, uh, can we get by with the lower value of BT for digital transmission? Probably so, okay. Again, the other thing, this is pulse distortion. There's no noise. The other thing we have to deal with is there's noise present on here. And we haven't talked about that at all. And typically what I would do is sample this every bit interval, compare the sample to a threshold, you know, either zero or maybe five volts and if it's you know, over two and a half, I call it a one. If it's below two and a half, I call it a zero. Okay, that's my binary decision maker. But if noise is present, I'm gonna make mistakes. You know, if I sample 
right here at a high noise spike, that noise spike might have me above the two and a half. And so what was transmitted, uh, zero was actually transmitted, but I make this decision that it's a one actually. So that would be a bit error. Okay, you could have the same thing. I didn't really show the noise writing on top of the pulses, but if there's a negative noise spike here, right where I sample where there's a one, that noise spike might take me below my threshold and I would make a mistake and call that a zero. So we're gonna make errors. Errors are always present in communications. In analog systems, we typically talk about the signal to noise ratio as a measure of the quality. For digital systems, we, we, we actually have something that's a little more quantitative. We talk about the rate at which bit errors occur or the bit error rate. You know, is one bit in a thousand? One bit in a million is wrong? There's always some sort of bit error rate. Okay. Now, if you look at things like the internet, they have all these different techniques for correcting errors when they occur. Okay, so they, they've got these error correction and detection techniques built in. They can request automatically, you know, when, when you get a packet, there's typically some sort of error checking, you know, like parity, or one common technique is what's known as a checksum. They'll, they'll just add all the bytes together to get a sum. So they'll transmit that sum on, uh, as well. When you receive the signal, you make that same calculation, add up all the bytes and compare the checksums. If they're different, you know an error occurred. And then you could request retransmission of that packet. Your computer systems do that automatically. The, the internet does that automatically. Actually, on the internet, there are two modes of transmission or two protocols, one that is called TCP, the Transport Control Protocol, and that's typically used for all file transfer transfers, okay? That's the one that has the error correction and uh, retransmission built in. You don't even, you know, you download something off the internet, you can be almost certain that it is error free. Not that the transmission um, occurred without error, but due to retransmission, uh, error detection and retransmission, the final result you get the final file you downloaded is error free. The other one is, is a, a protocol that's called UDP. Um, uh, Una, what is that? Unidatagram, transmit control protocol. Uh, U, UDP data, I forget what the U stands for. Regardless, there's no, it just transmits the data. There's no error correction, error detection that takes place. Okay, so you will see bit errors or, or hear bit errors or there would be bit errors and file transfers. So what good, what good is UDP? It's typically used for streaming audio and video, okay? You don't care if there's maybe a little glitch in the audio signal, you might not even notice it. There might be a little glitch in the video, you know, pixels wrong or something like that. But, um, you know, it's real time, so it has to be fast. You know, if there's a, if there's a bit error and you, would requ request retransmission of the packet, you know, that's gonna slow things down. You know, you might actually see, well, buffering, playing on, we're requesting packets and you wouldn't be able to watch the video or, or hear, the, hear the audio in real time. So UDP is typically used for these streaming services like audio and video where, you know, bit errors are okay. You don't really care. But if you're downloading an executable file off the internet, a new application, you know, if a, a bit error in an ex executable file, that would mean a wrong machine language instruction going to the processor, right? So the, the program would not run. In most cases, it would actually crash. So, you know, they use, that's what the transport control protocol is used for. But we're always gonna have these errors in, they're gonna be a function of the signal to the noise ratio. So bit error rate is, is tied to signal noise ratio. We're always going to have these errors. What we want to concentrate in, uh, concentrate on is how, how do we reduce the error? More signal power, that's one way. That can be expensive, right? And increase the signal noise ratio by using a lot more signal power, transmitting higher amplitudes for our pulses, okay? But there are limits on how much signal power you can dump on the line typically. If we can find ways to reduce the noise, you know, maybe using coaxial cable, which is shielded versus, you know, unshielded wires, that might reduce the noise. Um, and then also different, 
decision processing error, direction, error detection and correction techniques to reduce ultimately the overall bid error rate. Okay, that's it for today. So have a good weekend. Um, stay inside and watch television all weekend. Don't celebrate Memorial, it's not Memorial Day, it's Labor Day. Yeah, that's, that's a common mistake getting those confused though. Memorial Day, and Memorial Day is always in May. We used to, when I was a kid, they always called that the, well, in the South, they called that the 30th of May, so it was easy to remember. Or Decoration Day, where you go out and decorate the graves, that's, that's Memorial Day. Yeah, so.